Welcome to Spoon River, Illinois. It's a small town where the river curls upward to make a big scoop. Most of the people who live here have parents who have also lived here, but such is the way with small towns. On the surface, there isn't much happening here. There's the daily monotony of cars and talking and children in the park. But the real beauty of this place comes when you take a visit to Spoon River Graveyard, which is where I work. For hours, I stand on that hill there and I listen to the sounds of the winds in the trees. I listen, and I swear I can hear something. The voices of the people who are buried here, words from the graves that I tend to every day, each story rich with life and full of emotions and experiences you never read about in books. So please, come sit for a while and really listen. Close your eyes, hear the wind in the trees, and take in all the stories of this little town. We stand about this place, we the memories, and shade our eyes because we dread to read. June 17th, 1884, aged 21 years and three days and all things are changed. And we, we the memories, stand here for ourselves alone, for no eye marks us or would know why we are here. Your husband is dead. Your sister lives far away. Your father is bent with age. He has forgotten you. He scarcely leaves the house anymore. No one remembers your exquisite face, your lyric voice, how you sang even on the morning you were stricken, with piercing sweetness, with thrilling sorrow, before the advent of the child which died with you. It is all forgotten, save by us the river and the hill. Even they are changed. Only the burning sun and the quiet stars are the same. And we, we the memories, stand here in awe, our eyes closed with the weariness of tears. I loathed you, Spoon River. I tried to rise above you. I despised you as the place of my nativity. And there, in Rome, among the artists, speaking Italian, speaking French, I felt at times to be free of every trace of my origin, to be reaching the heights of art, to breathe the air that the masters breathed and see the world through their eyes. But still they would approach my artwork and they would ask, what are you getting at, my friend? At times the face looks like Apollo's, but other times it has a trace of Lincoln's. There was no culture, you know, in Spoon River. And I burned with shame and I held my peace. And what could I do? All weighed down and covered over with Western soil, but hope and pray for another birth in this world with all of Spoon River rooted out of my soul. Here I lie, close to a stunted rose bush in a forgotten place, where the thickets from Seaver's woods have crept over growing sparsely. And you, you are a leader in New York, the wife of a noted millionaire, a name in the society columns. Beautiful, admired, magnified perhaps by the mirage of distance. You have succeeded. I have failed in the eyes of the world. You are alive. I am dead. Yet I know that I vanquished your spirit. And I know that lying here, far from you, unheard of among your great friends in the brilliant world where you move, I am really 
the unconquerable power over your life that robs it of complete triumph. To all in the village, I seemed, no doubt, to go this way and that way, aimlessly. But here by the river, you can see at twilight, the soft-winged bats fly zigzag through the air. They must fly so to catch their food. And if you've ever lost your way at night in the deep wood near Miller's Ford, and dodged this way and now that, wherever the light of the Milky Way shone through, trying to find the path, then you should understand I sought the way with earnest zeal, and all my wanderings were wanderings in the quest. I was 16 and had the most terrible dreams and specks before my eyes of nervous weakness. And I couldn't remember the books I read, like Frank Drummer, who memorized page after page. And my back was weak and I worried and when I stood up to recite, I'd forget everything that I had studied. And then I saw Dr. Weiss's advertisement, and there I read everything in print, just as if he had known me, and about the dreams, which I couldn't help. So I knew I was marked for an early grave, and I worried until I had a cough. And then the dreams stopped, and I slept the sleep without dreams here on the hill by the river. There is something about death, like love itself. If with someone with whom you have known passion and the glow of youthful love, you also, after years of life together, feel the sinking of the fire, and thus fade away together, gradually, faintly, delicately, as it were in each other's arms, passing from the familiar room. That is a power of unison between souls, like love itself. There is something about death like love itself. If with someone with whom you have known passion, and the glow of youthful love, you also, after years of life together, feel the sinking of the fire, and thus fade away together, gradually, Faintly, delicately, as it were in each other's arms, passing from the familiar room. That is a power of unison between souls, like love itself. Herbert broke our engagement of eight years when Annabelle returned to the village from the seminary. Ah oh, me. If I had let my love for him alone, it might have grown into a beautiful sorrow. Who knows? Filling my life with healing fragrance. But I tortured it. I poisoned it. I blinded its eyes and it became hatred. Deadly ivy instead of clematis And my soul fell from its support, its tendrils tangled in decay. Do not let the will play gardener to your soul, unless you are sure it is wiser than your soul's nature. All your sorrow, Louise, and your hatred of me, sprang from your delusion that it was wantonness of spirit and contempt of your soul's rights, which made me turn to Annabelle and forsake you. You really grew to hate me for love of me, because I was your soul's happiness, formed and tempered to solve your life for you, but would not. You were my misery. If you were my happiness, would I not have clung to you? This is life's sorrow, that one can be happy only where two are, and that our hearts are drawn to stars which want us not. I have studied many times the marble which was chiseled for me, a boat with a furled sail at rest in the harbor. 
In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered to me, and I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow knocked at my door, but I was afraid. Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while, I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. To put meaning in one's life may end in madness, but a life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It is a boat longing for the sea and yet afraid No other man, unless it was Doc Hill, did more for people in this town than I. And all the weak, the halt, the improvident, and those who could not pay flocked to me. I was good-hearted, easy Dr. Myers. I was healthy, happy, and comfortable fortune, blessed with a congenial mate, my children raised, all wedded, doing well in the world. And then one night, Minerva, the poetess, came to me in her trouble, crying. I tried to help her out. She, she died. They indicted me. The newspapers disgraced me. My wife, perished of a broken heart, and pneumonia finished me. He protested all his life long. The newspapers lied about him villainously, that he was not at fault for Minerva's fall, but only tried to help her. Poor soul, so sunk in sin, that he could not see that even in trying to help her, as he called it, he had broken the law, human and divine. Passers-by, an ancient admonition to you, whether your ways be ways of pleasantness, and all your pathways peace, love God and keep his commandments. And Minerva, village poetess, shouted at, jeered at by the yahoos of the street for my heavy body, cockeye, and rolling walk. And all the more till, till Butch Weldy captured me after a brutal hunt. He left me to my fate with Dr. Myers and I sank into death, growing numb from the feet up, like one stepping deeper and deeper into a stream of ice. Will someone go to the village newspaper and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I thirsted so for love. I hungered so for life. Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, and Charlie? The weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter, all, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever. One was burned in a mine. One was killed in a brawl. One died in a jail. One fell from a bridge toiling for children and wife. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie and Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love, one at the hands of a brute in a brothel, one of a broken pride in search for heart's desire, 
One afterlife in faraway London and Paris was brought to her little space by Ella and Kate and Mag. All. All are sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac and Aunt Emily, and Old Towny Kincaid and Savine Houghton, and Major Walker, who had talked with venerable men of the Revolution? All. All are sleeping on the hill. They brought them dead sons from the war and daughters whom life had crushed, and their children fatherless, crying. All. All are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. I staggered on through darkness. There was a hazy sky, a few stars, which I followed as best I could. It was nine o'clock. I was trying to get home, but somehow I was lost, though really keeping the road. Then I reeled through a gate and into a yard and called at the top of my voice, Oh, Fiddler! Oh, Mr. Jones! I thought it was his house and he would show me the way home, but who would step out but A.D. Blood in his nightshirt, waving a stick of wood and roaring about the cursed saloons and the, the criminals they made? You drunken Oscar Hummel, he said, as I stood there, weaving to and fro, taking the blows from the stick in his hand until I, un until I dropped down, dead at his feet. Over and over, they used to ask me, while buying the wine or the beer, in Peoria first, and later in Chicago, Denver, Frisco, New York, wherever I lived, how I happened to lead the life, and what was the start of it. Well, I told them a silk dress in a promise of marriage from a rich man. It was Lucius Atherton. But that was not really it at all. Suppose a boy steals an apple from the tray at a grocery store, and they all begin to call him a thief. The editor, minister, judge, and all the people. A thief, a thief, a thief. And he can't get work, and he can't get bread without stealing it. Why the boy will steal. It is the way that people regard the theft of the apple that makes the boy what he is. Have you seen walking through the village a man with downcast eyes and haggard face? That is my husband, who by secret cruelty never to be told robbed me of my youth and my beauty, till at last wrinkled and with yellow teeth, in broken pride and shameful humility I sank into the grave. But what think you gnaws at my husband's heart, the face of what I was? The face of what he made me. These are driving him to the place where I lie in death. Therefore, I am avenged. The earth keeps some vibration going. There in your heart, and that is you. And if the people find that you can fiddle, why then fiddle you must for all the days of your life. Now what do you see? A harvest of clovers, a path through to the river. You run your hands through the wheat, the smell of beef, thereafter ready in the market. Or else you hear the rustling of skirts, like the girls by the river listening to Cooney Potter, a pillar of dust, or whirling leaves meant ruinous drought. They looked at me like I was redhead Sammy, Stepping it off to Toralore. And how could I till my forty acres, not to speak of getting more, with all the sounds of the crows and the sparrows and the creaking of the windmill, creating symphonies in my mind? And I never did start working on that field, that someone did not come and whisk me away to some dance or a party. And I ended up with forty acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle and a broken laugh, and a thousand memories, and not 
one single regret. Silent before the jury, returning no word to the judge when he asked me if I had aught to say against the sentence, only shaking my head. What could I say to people who thought that a woman of 35 was at fault when her lover of 19 killed her husband? Even though she had said to him over and over, go away, Elmer, go far away. I have maddened your brain with the gift of my body. You will do some terrible thing. And just as I feared, he killed my husband, with which I had nothing to do before God. Silent for 30 years in prison. And the old iron gates of Joliet swung as the gray and silent trustees carried me out in a coffin. At first I suspected something. She acted so calm and absent-minded. And one day I heard the back door shut as I entered the front and I saw him slink back of the smokehouse into the lot and run across the fields. And I meant to kill him on sight. But that day, Walking near Fourth Bridge without a stick or a stone at hand, all of a sudden I saw him standing, scared to death, holding his rabbits, and all I could say was, Don't! 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 As he aimed and fired at my heart! What but the love of God would have softened in me forgiving the people of Spoon River? towards me who wronged the bed of Thomas Merritt and murdered him beside. Oh, loving hearts that took me in again when I returned from 14 years in prison. Oh, helping hands that in the church received me and heard with tears my penitent confession, who took the sacrament of bread and wine. Repent, ye living ones, and rest with Jesus. was not beloved of the villagers, but all because I spoke my mind and met those who transgressed against me with plain remonstrance, hiding nor nurturing, nor secret griefs, nor grudges. That act of the Spartan boy is greatly praised, the one who hid the wolf underneath his cloak, letting it devour him uncomplainingly. It is braver, I think, to snatch the wolf forth and fight him openly, even in the street, amid dust and howls of pain. The tongue may be an unruly member, but silence poisons the soul. Berate me who will. I am content. I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy, and strong, and the first place I worked was at Thomas Green's, and on a summer's day, while she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me right in his arms, kissing my throat, I turning my head, and then neither of us seemed to know what happened, and I cried for what would become of me, and cried and cried as my secret began to show. One day, Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me and, being childless, would adopt it. You see, he had given her a farm to be still. So she hid up in the house and sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her. And all went well and the child was born. They were so kind to me. Later, I married Gus Wortman and years passed, but at political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, that was not it, no. I wanted to say, that's my son. Dust of my dust and dust with my dust. O 
a child who died as you entered the world, dead with my death, not knowing breath though you tried so hard, with a heart that beat when you lived with me and stopped when you left me for life. It is well, my child, for you never traveled the long, long way that begins with school days, and little fingers blur under the tears that fall onto the crooked letters. And the earliest wound, when the little mate leaves you alone for another, and sickness, and the face of fear by the bed, the death of a father, or a mother, or shame for them, or poverty, the maiden sorrows of school days ended, and eyeless nature that makes you drink from the cup of love, though you know it is poisoned. To whom would your flower face have been lifted? Botanist? Weakling? Cry of what blood to yours, pure or foul, for it makes no matter. It is blood that calls to our blood. And then your children, what might they be? And what your sorrow, child, child, death is better than life. Reverend Wilde, he advised me not to divorce him for the sake of the children. And Judge Summers advised him the same. So we stuck to the end of the path. But two of the children sided with him, and two of the children sided with me. And the two who sided with him blamed me. And the two who sided with me blamed him. And all were torn with the guilt of judging and tortured in soul because they could not equally admire both him and me. Now every gardener knows that plants grown in cellars are yellow, weak, and crumble. And no mother would let her baby suck diseased milk from her breast. Yet, preachers and judges advise the raising of souls. There is no sunlight, only twilight, no warmth, only cold. Preachers and judges. Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife. And almost a year to creep back into strength. Till the dawn of our wedding decennial found me my seeming self again. We walked the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes, and you could not look in my eyes. For such sorrow was ours, the beginning of gray in your hair, and I but a shell of myself. And what did we talk of? Sky and water? Anything most to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses set on the table to grace our dinner, Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to live and imagine a remembered rapture. Then my spirit drooped as the night came on and you left me alone in my room for a while, as you did when I was a bride. Poor heart. And I looked in the mirror and something said, one should be all dead when one is half dead. Nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it, looking there in the mirror. Dear, have you ever understood? We had quarreled that morning, for he was 65 and I was 30. And I was nervous and heavy with the child whose birth I dreaded. I thought back to the last letter written to me by the estranged young soul whose betrayal of me I had concealed by marrying the old man. Then I took morphine and I sat down to read. Across the blackness that came over my eyes, I see the flickering light of these words even now. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And just as the words in the wind had come, 
they slowly die down, the souls once again at rest on the hill. Will you remember the stories of Georgia Gray or Oscar Hummel? Will you remember the people of Spoon River? Will you remember us once the sun has reduced us to shadows, to dust? The sun is coming up over the river, and once again, this is a town full of life. There is a wind in the trees, but the wind carries the songs of birds, not the songs of souls. Just as the river twists and turns and snakes its way through the town, so do we through life. On our own journeys, we each make stories to tell, and someday we too will all be at rest, sleeping on the hill.